Hi everybody, I hope your first day went well. We're now going to recap what we learned today to try to help you integrate it into a bigger picture modeling framework. But first, who am I? My name is Megan Peters, and in addition to helping out with Neuromatch Academy, I'm also an assistant professor of cognitive sciences at the University of California, Irvine, which is just outside Los Angeles. In my research, I study perception, metacognition, and consciousness in humans using computational modeling, machine learning, and neuroimaging techniques. And when I'm not thinking about brains and computations, I also like gardening, science fiction, travel, and karaoke. But most of the time, I like thinking about brains and computations, and that's pretty much exactly what we got started thinking about today, brains and computations. So today, we learned that one of the most intuitive ways to classify models is to think about the types of potential questions they might answer. For a given problem or question, we can think of it as fitting into one of these three categories. Is this a descriptive question about what is happening in a system? Is this a mechanistic question about how a system works? Or is this an interpretive question about why a system behaves the way it does? And so the models that we build help us answer these broad categories of questions. Models typically also fall into these three general categories, although of course they can span across the categories too. And today we went over one version of each of these models, just one example, so you could try to make it really concrete. So in today's wrap up, I want to sum up what we did, what we learned, and also talk about how it all relates to the process of modeling as a whole. In the first tutorial, we first saw a what, or a descriptive model, which examined spike trains and interspike intervals. So this is where we wore our what scientist hats, and we asked questions like, well, there must be a way to describe interspike intervals. What could that be? What could that look like? What would it tell us? And so in this investigation, we learned how to load the spike data set and figure out its structure, we learned to plot it and visualize the spiking activity across the population of neurons. We learned to compute the distribution of interspike intervals. And then we tried out a few functions to fit them to the data and see which one described the data the best. So in a nutshell, this model asked, what is the best description for the behavior of this system? And the answer was that a specific model fit better than another one. In the next model we talked about today, uh, that was a how model or a mechanistic model. And in this one, we examined how different details of the balance of excitation and inhibition makes the simulated neural system behave like the real neurons. So we wore our how scientist hats, and we first thought about how those interspike interval distributions looked exponential. And we thought, well, there's probably a specific mechanism that makes them that way. We asked how that would work in a biophysical system, like what bits of physiology could make it do that. Uh, and we also knew that neurons have capacitance. So we figured we better build that kind of integration in, and we wanted to see if that explained the way the system was working. And so to remind you of our learning objectives, what we did to get through this detective kind of process was we first coded the simple leaky integrate and fire model, and we discovered that it didn't work properly to produce Poisson spiking, like right out of the box, unless we added those realistic biophysical details in very specific ways. So what this meant is through, through this tutorial, we got a window into how those details mechanistically bring out the specifics of the system that we're studying. And we discovered that the way to get the system to behave correctly was that we had to make sure the excitation and inhibition were balanced. And finally today, we saw a why kind of model or a normative interpretive model, an ideal observer kind of approach. So in this uh, tutorial, we asked why neurons spike in the patterns the way they do, why the Poisson spiking is the best description for the behavior. So wearing our why scientist hats, we pulled together the observations from our last two tutorials and said, okay, I know the interspike inter interval histogram looks exponential. 
and I know how that works in the real neurons, but why does the system do that? Evolution probably could have come up with some other way of making spike trains. What's the point? Why is the brain this way? And so to answer these kinds of questions, in this tutorial, we learned what entropy was as a measure of the amount of information in a system. And then we computed the entropy of some toy systems. And then we finally computed the entropy of the spiking activity from the data set we've been playing with. And what we found out was that a Poisson distributed spiking model, that the Poisson distributed spikes end up maximizing the information that can be transmitted in a neural system. It's optimal. It's the best way the system could behave mathematically. So this normative model gives us a window into what factors might have been optimized in one way or another by, say, evolutionary pressures. So that was a recap of our what, how, and why kind of modeling questions. But that's not the only kind of distinction that's potentially useful. So remember Marr, his three levels of uh, complexities, his hierarchy of complexities. So some of Marr's three levels map onto the what, how, and why distinction pretty nicely, but some of them don't. And since Marr has been so influential in how we think about computational models and neuroscience, we thought we'd remind you about how these things go together. So the what models that we've kind of described today are a little bit outside the hierarchy. But the why and the how models span Mars three levels quite nicely. So first we have at the computational level, this is really a good mapping to those why or the interpretation type questions. So they ask, what's the objective of the system? How close is the system to achieving that objective? How close is the system to optimal? Then it gets a little bit muddier. So at Mars algorithmic level, level two, we can ask about the data structures and the approximations involved. We could also ask what is the runtime of the system that it requires to be able to accomplish the various computations or approximations. And then all the way down at the implementation level, level three, we can ask about the hardware. Uh, and specifically, we can ask, is it neurons? Is it synapses? Is it molecules? Is it something else entirely? Of course, there's disagreement a little bit about how exactly those what, how, and why models map on to Mars' hierarchy of complexities, Mars' three levels of analysis, but that's okay. These categories are not meant to be exclusive. They're just helpful ways for you to think about the problems that you might be facing. So how we choose which models are the right ones and how to actually implement them can be thought of as a decision process where we have to think about what questions we're asking and what goals we want to set for ourselves. Do we care about what is going on, how it is happening, or why? Do we want to study the system at the level of cells and synapses on the one hand, or all the way up at the level of information on the other? Maybe somewhere in between is a good target. So the introduction you all did today is only the first step, which is just about framing the question. Then you have to implement and test your model. You have to publish it. You have to do more experiments and come up with new hypotheses and the whole process starts again. This is a whole big cycle. So this whole exercise makes modeling a series of decisions or a decision process about what we think is important, what questions we want to ask and answer, and what toolkits we think are the best for the job, how to evaluate our model's behavior and how to interpret your results so you can share them with the broader scientific community. So this is the decision process that you all will be engaging in throughout Neuromatch Academy, both in the actual tutorials and in your own group projects. And tomorrow, you're going to start delving into those projects a little bit more. So it's really important to keep this process in mind throughout tomorrow's discussions. But before we do that, we have one more thing to do. We need to take a bigger picture look at the diversity of models that are available. So you can start to learn how to pick which one goes best with the questions that you want to answer in your own research, of course, but also here at Neuromatch Academy. Importantly, when we engage in the decision process about how to model, we need to make decisions, not just about the scale of abstraction from neurons to systems to people, and also not just about the type of question, the what, the how, and the why. In fact, 
Paying attention to these features is really important because they also help define the goals of a particular modeling framework. This can help you, and also the reviewers of your future papers, uh, define how to evaluate whether your model is successful or not. So knowing which models are out there and how they differ from one another can also help you think about what you can expect to get out of a model, both in terms of what it can do, but also in terms of its limitations. And I'll remind you here that everyone's got their own objectives, their own goals, and they're all okay. And the important thing to note is that all of them uh, can ask different questions at different levels of abstraction, and all of these potential goals are valid and useful. So I wanted to take a brief look at the goals aspect here before we close down for the day. What is it that you want your model to do? What do you want to get out of it? And what can you expect to accomplish? Because each goal is not necessarily better than any other one, uh, we can get started with some possible goals to think about when selecting your modeling framework and approach. So as I go through these, start to think about which ones you think are important. And remember, there is no right or wrong answer. So maybe you want your models to be useful. Some models of the nervous system are also good at solving real world problems. So for example, a model of the visual system might be able to solve challenging problems in computer vision. Maybe you want your model to be normative. Some models provide the optimal solutions to problems that might exist in the real world. So these kinds of models are maybe used in domains where behavior or neural properties are expected to be optimal or near optimal. So we might ask whether a model supplies the optimal solution to a computational problem faced by the brain. Maybe you want your models to actually be clinically relevant. So some models can produce insights that are relevant for developing or evaluating different clinical interventions. These models have the potential to reduce human suffering. And so there's no doubt that clinical relevance is also a meaningful goal. Maybe you want to inspire experiments. Some models change the way we think about a problem. And so they raise interesting new hypotheses. This can then inspire new experiments. Maybe you want realism at the microscopic scale. So maybe you want microscopic properties of the brain, you wanna get those right, such as the synaptic or pharmacological or cellular level properties. Maybe instead you want realism, but on the macroscopic scale. So some models describe properties of brain areas and networks, and addressing phenomena at this level might be attractive to a lot of different neuroscientists. Maybe you also want realism, but now at the behavioral level. Some models can faithfully describe and explain behavioral phenomena, and that's valid too. Maybe you want your models to be representational. Some models aim to use representations of information that are similar to representations that might be found in the brain. You also might want a model that's compact, tightly bound up. Some models can be succinctly expressed in mathematical language or computer code. This makes them particularly easy for humans to understand, and that can be very useful. Maybe you also want your model to be analytically tractable. Some models are understandable through math, just a bunch of equations instead of numerical simulations. And so for scientists with good mathematical training, this can provide a more generalizable understanding compared to some numerical models. Maybe you want your model to be interpretable. You want it to be easily interpreted with respect to how it works, what outcomes it predicts, how the brain might implement the computations, so the underlying causal mechanisms. And the last goal that I'll mention is beauty. Some models might be symmetrical or balanced or resonate well with the way we think about the world or the brain. So this ephemeral quality is often a factor when assessing the merit of the model. And remember, none of these models or none of these goals is worse than another one or better than another one. They're really just different. So you might be thinking, okay, so we learned about all of these model types, the what, the how, and the why, and now we have all these goals to think about. Where do I even begin? Should I start by trying to build what models? And then when I get good at those, I can move on to the how models, and then next I can move up to the why kind. So it's not really a fair thing for me to ask you though, uh, because there's really no right answer. 
There's no right kind of model to build. The type of model you want to build depends entirely on your goals, on what kinds of questions you want to be able to ask and answer. But I'll say that some model types are often more difficult uh, to build and interpret than others. So it's often the case that the what models are on the easier end of the scale. It can be a lot simpler to describe what's going on than to try to draw conclusions about how it happens or why the system works the way it does. Uh, so if you're just starting out, sometimes those what end of the scale models, these what models over here, um, might be really good ones to tackle first, especially in your group projects here at Neuromatch Academy. Now, if you're more familiar with modeling, you might be able to tackle uh, some of those why questions. And you, you'll probably uh, think about this a lot more when you learn more about your projects tomorrow. So keep this all in mind. There's no right answer, but there is a gradation of difficulty with, between the what, the how, and the why. So as you can see, the diversity of goals and models available really means we've got a lot of choices to make. And we can't necessarily just start at the what models and then go on from there. Different models allow us to answer different types of questions. And what my idea is of a good model might not match with what your idea is. So that's why model diversity is a really good thing. I wanted to put up this graph of a survey that Conrad Cording, Gunnar Blom, Paul Schrader, and Kendrick Kay did just a few years ago, asking scientists which goals they thought were important. And what I wanna point out here is that there's a ton of disagreement. There's a ton of difference of opinion. So this is almost a uniform distribution and the error bars are really large. So there's a lot of diversity here. We really like model diversity here at Neuromatch Academy too. However, with all this diversity of valid goals, you are probably asking, how do I choose which model to use? So making these choices is kind of the whole point of what we're trying to do here at Neuromatch Academy. We want to help you see that the diversity of model goals and options and variants and choices are out there. And we want to help you learn to make good choices about how to approach interesting questions about your data and about data from other people. From starting out with why do we model today and a bit of model fitting, we're going to then jump headfirst into some seriously powerful toolkits. From GLMs to reinforcement learning to optimal control to modeling real neurons and more. But what we want you to take away, the most important thing to take away here, is that the diversity is the point. By exploring the different types of models and mastering different techniques, you can then select the right toolkit for your question and your goals. And that's the point. So have a think about this and have fun and we'll see you tomorrow.